In this video, we're going to introduce our discussion of acids and bases in chemistry. Let's go ahead and get started. So we have three different sets of definitions for acids and bases. Our first one is the Arrhenius theory, which was published in 1887 by Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius. Uh, you may recognize that name from the Arrhenius equation in kinetics. He was doing a lot of stuff with different types of reactions. And Arrhenius really defined acids and bases as what was happening to different ions that formed in the reaction. So we're going to use red for acids and blue for bases. So according to Arrhenius, an acid is something that produces H plus ions when it dissociates. So we end up with H plus ions as our product. Now, we know now, we've done a little bit more work since Arrhenius' time, and we know now that when we have something in solution that produces H plus ions, where they ionize in a hydrogen proton is uh, one of the products, it connects with water to form H3O plus, which is a hydronium ion. So we'll use these interchangeably, H plus and hydronium ions. Just know that in real solutions, it looks like this. We don't really have protons just floating around. So a common example here could be HCl, hydrochloric acid. When it ionizes, it produces H plus and Cl minus. So that H plus lets us know this is an Arrhenius acid. For bases, the base definition for an Arrhenius base is that it produces OH minus ions in solution also known as hydroxide ions. So if our product of our reaction produces OH minus, it's an Arrhenius base. For example, sodium hydroxide, when it ionizes, produces Na plus and OH minus. The OH minus indicates to us this is an Arrhenius base. Now, this idea of producing hydronium ions or hydroxide ions is our Arrhenius definition. I'm putting it in this little circle here because it's the most specific definition we have for acids and bases. Our other two definitions are gonna be a little bit broader. So only some acids and bases that we now know act as acids and bases will identify as Arrhenius acids. So if it produces H plus or OH minus, it is an Arrhenius acid or Arrhenius base. We do have other acids and bases that don't fall into this specific definition, but will fall into our other two definitions. For example, our next theory, and it kind of goes in order of time because as we know, science progresses and builds on previous theories. So our next theory is the Bronsted-Lowry theory. In 1923, there were a lot of chemists and physical chemists working on these things. So Simultaneously-ish, both Johannes Bronsted in Denmark and Thomas Lowry in uh, the United Kingdom really defined acids bases in a different way by focusing more on the reactants than what's happening in the products. By doing this, they broaden the definition just a bit because now we don't have to rely on these acids and bases being in water because in order to produce OH- and H3O+, in the Arrhenius theory, we need to have a water-based solution. The Bronsted-Lowry theory allows us to look just at the reactants separate from the solution that they're in. So it allows us to have a little bit of a broader definition instead of the narrow water-based solutions of the Arrhenius theory. So what are those definitions? Well, Bronsted and Lowry both defined acids. They didn't work together. They just independently published, so they both get the name. Uh, defined an acid as a proton donor, which means that the species has a hydrogen, a proton, that it can then donate to the solution or something else. So in our example up here, this HCl is still a Bronsted-Lowry acid. It's donating that hydrogen to solution, but we could also donate it to something else, another species. Similarly, the Bronsted-Lowry base is seen as a proton acceptor. It's something that's going to accept a proton. It doesn't have a proton and it would really like one. Oftentimes, in order to describe Bronsted-Lowry acids and bases, one species is acting as the acid, donating the proton. The other is acting as the base, accepting the proton. So these really work in conjunction with each other, much like in redox reaction, how we have one species being oxidized and the other being reduced. For example, if I had our hydrochloric acid plus our, let's say, ammonia, 
The products of these, well, we can see that this H is going to get donated to the ammonia. The ammonia will become NH4+. Meanwhile, the hydrochloric acid will lose its hydrogen and become chloride ion. So we can see here that in this situation, even though there's no H plus and OH minus being produced, we do still have an acid, proton donor, and a base, bronsted lowry proton acceptor, in the reaction. So you can see in this example how this allows us to be a little bit broader with our definition, even in the absence of water-based ionization. So that is our bronsted lowry definition. All right, 1923 was a big year for acid-base chemistry. It's a hot year because concurrently with the bronsted lowry theory being published in 1923, another theorist, Gerard Lewis, in 1923 in UC Berkeley in the US, said, you know what? The issue with bronsted lowry is that we have still hydrogens being donated or accepted, and that limits us to only describing species that have hydrogens in it. What about a species, a reactant that doesn't have hydrogens, but could still act in this kind of acid-based manner where we're exchanging and trading things? And so he came up with the Lewis theory, which is focused instead of on protons, which is restricted to hydrogen ions, uh, it's focused more on just electron orbitals. So for the Lewis theory, it's a nice broad theory that can apply to any species where a Lewis acid has an empty electronic orbital. And that means that if we have an empty orbital, if we recall our atomic chemistry, that means we're ready to accept electrons in a bond. We can say, yep, come on over. We'd love some electrons, please. That's what makes it a Lewis acid. A Lewis base is the species that has basically extra electrons that it would be happy to donate. And so in combination, the acid will accept the electron pair and the base will donate that electron pair forming what's called a coordinate bond. And again, this can happen in the context of acid-base chemistry in Bronsted-Lowry where those relationships can be happening with hydrogens, but they can also happen with species that are not hydrogen-based. Lewis acids and bases can be a little harder to visualize because instead of working with full hydrogens, um, and protons, we're looking at electron pairs, which again, we have to visualize usually with a Lewis structure and the atomic theory. So to do this, we're gonna use the example that Lewis himself used, which is boron trifluoride. And I'll draw it up here in our little circle here for Lewis acids, but if we sketch this out briefly, boron trifluoride has one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons because it shares each with the fluoride. Now fluoride is happy because fluorine has seven valence electrons and when it shares one with boron, now it's got a full octet, right? It has eight. But we can see here that boron's not super thrilled because remember atoms really love having eight electrons and it only has six, which means it would be an Excellent Lewis acid. That's kind of how you can tell if something's gonna be a Lewis acid. Is it missing some of its electrons? It can work as boron trifluoride, it's fine, but it would be really happy if someone donated it two electrons. And so we can combine that with maybe fluoride ion. Fluoride ion has a full octet, but it could share. It could be willing to have a full uh, electron pair that it would donate and share with boron and become boron tetrafluoride instead of trifluoride. And that's exactly what happens in this type of reaction where the fluoride ion here is the Lewis base and the boron trifluoride is the Lewis acid. Again, these can be a little tricky to visualize, but recognize that what we're forming here is a bond. Specifically, the bonds that form are called coordinate bonds, coordinate covalent that form from our Lewis acid base chemistry, where we're really retaining our ionic structure a little bit. It's gonna be BF4 minus, so we retain that minus charge, but we still get a more stable structure. So these are actually quite stable bonds and they happen between Lewis acids, empty orbital, would love some electrons, and a base which has some to donate and share. Okay, so now that we have all of our definitions, let's zoom back out for a second. Why did I do nested circles? Well, because kind of like 
all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. The same is true with our acid levels. So all Arrhenius acids are also bronsted Lowry acids, are also Lewis acids. They fall within that larger definition. However, some Lewis acids will not be bronsted Lowry or Arrhenius because these guys have more specific definitions. So you can kind of see that if we are working with an Arrhenius acid, it will always be bronsted Lowry and Lewis. If we're working with bronsted Lowry, it'll always also be a Lewis acid, but Lewis acids are our broadest definitions and we can uh, see that if we don't have any hydrogens present, the only definition we can work with is a Lewis acid. If we have hydrogens, but we're not producing OH minus and H plus, then we're wor working within the realm of bronsted Lowry. And then if we're producing OH minus and H3O plus or H plus, and specifically looking at those definitions, it's Arrhenius. Now, what do we typically use in chemistry? Great question. Typically, we actually use the bronsted lowry definitions when we're specifically talking about acid-base reactions. So things like titrations, um, making neutralization reactions, the bicarbonate buffer system, which is an acid-base reaction in our bodies, will usually use the bronsted lowry definition because it's nice and easy and visual to work with. But to Lewis's point, sometimes we want to describe reactions that don't have hydrogens in them. Usually we'll be doing this in organic chemistry or larger chemical reactions, organic chemical reactions, um, where we're really trying to follow the electron bonds and the covalent bonds that are formed, in which case then a Lewis definition is better. But again, if we're picking between the two, bronsted Lowry is more specific, so it allows us to describe what's going on a little bit more accurately with those protons in the solution. And as we'll talk about in our later lessons, protons become really important when defining the acidity or basicity of a solution at large. So in conclusion, if you're working with larger molecular reactions or you're moving on to organic chemistry, you might talk about Lewis acids and bases more often. If we're working in the world of solutions and like acid content in a solution or in our body, focus on our bronsted Lowry definitions. Okay, and that was our three basic definitions of acids and bases and how they relate to each other. Remember, we build on past theories in chemistry, so even though Arrhenius isn't used as often anymore, it was the foundation for understanding the bronsted Lowry and the Lewis theories of acids and bases. Continue to practice with the differences and similarities between these terms, and I'll see you in the next video.